Yak it to me. Voice of the Web. Ancient Fires. By C. Brequin. The Seventh Jules de Grandin Story, produced by Roland Weifering. Tyens, French Robridge, this is interesting. Jules de Grandin passed a classified page of the Times across the breakfast table and indicated one of the small advertisements with the polished nail of his well-groomed forefinger. Regard this savus, if you please, and say, if I am not the man. Fixing my reading glasses firmly on my nose, I perused the notice he pointed out, wanted a man of more than ordinary courage to undertake confidential and possibly dangerous mission. Great physical strength not essential, but indomitable bravery and absolute fearlessness in the face of seemingly supernatural manifestations are. This is a remarkable work and will require the services of a remarkable man. A fee up to $10,000 will be paid for the successful prosecution of the case. XL Selfridge, Attorney, Jennifer Building. De Grandin's round blue eyes shone with elated anticipation as I put down the paper and regarded him across the cloth. Mother Blue, is it not an apple from the tree of divine providence? He demanded, twisting the ends of his diminutive blonde mustache ferociously. A remarkable man for a remarkable work, do they say? Carlu, but Jules de Grandin is that man, nor do I in any wise imply perhaps. You will drive me down to that so generous solicitor, friend Trowbridge, and we shall together collect from him this ten thousand dollars, or may I never hear the blackbirds whistle in the trees of street cloud again. Sounds like some bootlegger advertising for a first lieutenant, I discouraged, but he would not be gainsaid. We shall go, we shall most certainly go to see this remarkable lawyer, who offers a remarkable fee to a remarkable man, he insisted, rising and dragging me from the table. Mother Blue, my friend, excitement is good and gold is good, too, but gold and excitement together lot lot, they are a combination worthy of any man's love. Come, we shall go right away, at once, immediately. We went. Half an hour later we were seated across a flat-topped mahogany desk, staring at a thin, undersized little man with an oversized bald head and small, sharp bird-like black eyes. This seems incredibly good, gentlemen, the little lawyer assured us when he had finished examining the credentials de Grandin showed. I had hoped to get some ex-serviceman some youngster who hadn't gotten his fill of adventure in the Great War, perhaps, or possibly some student of psychic phenomena, but my dear sir, he beamed on my friend to secure a man of your standing is more than I had dared hope. Indeed, I did not suspect such characters existed outside book covers. Parbleu, Monsieur Ravu, de Grandin replied with one of his impish smiles, I have been in what you Americans call some tight places, but never have I been shut up in a book. Now, if you will be so good as to tell us something of this so remarkable mission you wish undertaken, he paused, voice and eyebrows raised interrogatively. To be sure, the attorney passed a box of cigars across the desk. You'll probably consider this a silly sort of case for a man of your talents, but well, to get down to brass tacks, I have a client who wants to sell a house. Ah, uh, de Grandin murmured noncommittally. And we are to become indomitably fearless real estate brokers, perhaps? Not quite, the lawyer laughed, nothing quite as simple as that. You see, Red Gables is one of the finest properties in the entire lake region. It lies in the very heart of the mountains, with a commanding view, contains nearly 3,000 acres of good land, and, in fact, possesses nearly every requisite of an ideal country estate, or a summer hotel or sanitarium. Normally, it's worth between three and four hundred thousand dollars, but, unfortunately, it possesses one drawback a drawback which makes its market value practically nil. It's haunted. Eh, do you say so? De Grandin sat up very straight in his chair and fixed his unwinking stare on the attorney. Parbleu, it will be a redoubtable ghost whom Jules de Grandin cannot eject for a fee of 200,000 francs. Say on, my friend, I've been with curiosity. The house was built some 75 years ago when that part of New York State was little better than a wilderness, the attorney resumed. John Aglenberry, son of Sir Rufus Aglenberry, and the great uncle of my client, was the builder. He came to this country under something of a cloud pretty well estranged from his family and built that English manor house in the midst of our hills as a refuge from all mankind, it seems. As a young man he'd served with the British Army in India and got mixed up in rather a nasty scandal. 
when Ghazi fell in love with a native girl and threatened to marry her. There was a devil of row. His folks used influence to have him dismissed from the service and cut off his allowance to force him back to England. After that they must have made life pretty uncomfortable for him, for when he inherited a pile of money from a spinster aunt, he packed up and came to America, building that beautiful house out there in the woods and living like a hermit the rest of his life. The girl's family didn't take matters much easier than Aglan Berries, it seems. Something mysterious happened to her before he left India and I imagined he'd have stayed there in spite of hell and high water if she'd lived. Somehow, the Aglanberry fortune petered out. John Aglanberry's younger brothers both came to this country and settled in New York, working at one thing and another till he died. They inherited the property share and share alike under our law, but it never did them any good. Neither of them was ever able to live in it and they never could sell it. Something, mind you, I'm not saying it was a ghost, but something damned unpleasant, nevertheless, has run off every tenant who's ever attempted to occupy that place. My client is young John Allenberry, great nephew of the builder, and last of the family. He hasn't a cent to bless himself with except the potential value of Red Gables. That's the situation, gentlemen, a young man, heir to a baronetcy, if he wished to go to England, to claim it, poorer than a church mouse, with a half million dollar property aiding itself up in taxes, and no way to convert it into a diamond cash till he can find someone to demonstrate that the place isn't devil-ridden. Do you understand why we are willing to pay a $10,000 fee contingent on the success of re-establishing Red Gable's good name? Tyans, Misher, de Grandin exclaimed, grinding the fire from his half-smoked cigar, we do waste the time. I am all impatient to try conclusions with this property-destroying ghost who keeps your so deserving client out of the negotiation of his land and me from a $10,000 fee. Morbdlu, this is a case after my own heart. When shall we start for this so charming estate which is to pay me $10,000 for ridding it of its specter tenants? John Aglenberry, chiefly distinguished by a wide, friendly grin, met us at the railway station which lay some five miles from Red Gables and extended a warm hand clasp in greeting. It's mighty good of you gentlemen to come up here and give me a lift, he exclaimed, as he shepherded us along the platform and helped stow our traps into the unkempt tonneau of a Ford which might have seen better days, though not recently. Mr. Selfridge phoned me yesterday morning, and I hustled up here to do what I could to make you comfortable. I doubt you'd have been able to get any of the village folks to drive you over to the place they're as frightened of it as they would be of a mad dog. But, Misher, de Grandin expostulated, do you mean to say you have been in that house by yourself this morning? Uh-huh, and last night, too, our host replied. Came up here on the afternoon train yesterday and tidied things up a bit. And you saw nothing, felt nothing, heard nothing. De Grandin persisted. Of course not, the young man answered impatiently. There isn't anything to see or feel, or hear, either, if you accept the usual noises that go with the country place in springtime. There's nothing wrong with the property, gentlemen. Just a lot of silly gossip which has made one of the finest potential summer resorts in the county a drug on the market. That's why Mr. Selfridge and I are so anxious to get the statement of gentlemen of your caliber behind us. One word from you will outweigh all the silly talk these yokels can blab in the next ten years. De Grandin cast me a quick smile. He acknowledges our importance, my friend, he whispered. Truly, we shall have to walk fast to live up to such a reputation. Further conversation was cut short by our arrival at the gates of our future home. The elder Aglenberry had spared no expense to reproduce a bit of England in the Adirondacks. Tall posts of stone flanked the high iron gate which pierced the ivy-mantled wall surrounding the park, and a wide graveled driveway, bordered on each side by a wall of cedars, led to the house, which was a two-story Tudor structure with shingles of natural red cedar from which the place derived its name. Inside, the house bore out the promise of its exterior. The hall was wide and stone-paved, wainscoted with panels of walnut and with a beam ceiling of adhune cedar logs and slabs. A field stone fireplace, almost as large as the average suburban cottage's garage, pierced the north wall, and the curving stairs were built with wide treads and balustrated with hand-carved walnut. A single oil painting, that of the elder John Aglenberry, relieved the darkness of the wall facing the stairway. But, Misher, 
This is remarkable, de Grandin asserted, as he gazed upon the portrait. From the resemblance you bear your late kinsman you might easily be taken for his son yes Parwu, were you dressed in the archaic clothes of his period, you might be himself. I've noticed the resemblance, too, young Aglenberry smiled. Poor old Uncle John, gloomy looking cove, wasn't he? Anyone would think all his friends were dead, and he was making plans to visit the village undertaker himself. The Frenchman shook his head reprovingly at the younger man's facetiousness. Poor gentleman, he murmured, he had cause to look sad. When you, too, have experienced the sacrifice of love, you may look saddened, my friend. We spent the remainder of the afternoon surveying the house and surrounding grounds. Dinner was cooked on a portable camp outfit over blazing logs in the hall fireplace, and about nine o'clock all three of us mounted the stairs to bed. Remember, de Grandin warned, if you hear or see the slightest intimation of anything which is not as it should be, you are to ring the bell beside your bed, my friend. Dr. Trowbridge and I shall sleep, like the cat, with one eye open. And claws alert. Not a chance, our host cuffed. I slept here last night and never saw or heard anything more supernatural than a stray rat, and mighty few of those. I might have slept half an hour, or twice that long when a gentle nudge brought me wide awake, and sitting bolt upright in bed. Trowbridge, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin's voice came through the darkness from across the room, rise, and follow, I think I hear Mr. Aglenberry's alarm bell. I slipped a bathrobe over my pajamas and took the loaded automatic and flashlight from under my pillow. All right, I whispered, I'm ready. We stole down the hall toward our host's room and de Grandin paused beside the door. Clearly we made out the sound of an untroubled sleeper's heavy breathing, Guess you've been hearing things, de Grandin, I chuckled in low voice, but he held up one slender hand in warning. P.S.S.D., be still. He commanded. Do not you hear it, too, my friend? Hark. I listened with bated breath, but no sound save the occasional ghostly creak of a floorboard came to my ears, then faint, so faint it might have been mistaken for the echo of an imagined sound, had it not been for its insistence, I heard the light, far away sounding tinkle tink club bells. T-I-N-K at ink, a T-I-N-K a T-I-N-K, T-I-N-K a T-I-N-K, a T-I-N-K a T-I-N-K they sounded, scarcely louder than the swishing of silk, every third and fifth beat accentuated in an endless circular rhythm, but their music did not emanate from the room beyond the door. Rather, it seemed to me, the tiny, fairy-like ringing came up the stairway from the hall, below. My companion seemed struck by the same thought for he crept past me toward the stairhead, his soft-soled slippers making no more noise against the hardwood floor, and the beating of a moth's wings against the night air. Close behind him I slipped, my gun and flashlight held an instant readiness, but at sight of his eager, strained face, as he paused at the top of the stair I forgot my weapons and stole forward to peep over his shoulder. A shutter must have come unfastened at one of the small, high windows in the hall, for a patch of dim moonlight, scarcely more than three feet in diameter, lay upon the floor directly beneath the portrait of the elder Aglenberry, and against the circle of luminance a thin, almost impalpable wreath of smoke seemed drifting before a draft of air from the fireplace. I looked again. No, it was not smoke, it was something with a defined outline. It was it was a wisp of muslin, air light, and almost colorless in its sheerness, but cloth, nevertheless. And now, as I gazed unbelievingly, something else seemed slowly taking form in the moonlight. A pair of narrow, high-arched feet, and tapering, slender ankles, unclothed except for a double loop of bell-studded chains, were mincing and gyrating on flexible toes, while, fainter than the feet, but still perceptible, the outline of a body as fair as any that ever swayed to the tempo of music showed against the black background of the darkened hall, like a figure dimly suggested in an impressionistic painting. Round and round, in a dazing but incredibly graceful dance the vision world, the hem of the muslin skirt standing outward with the motion of the pirouetting feet, the tiny, golden bells on the chain anklets sending out their fairy music. Mordlieu! De Grandin whispered softly to himself. Do you see it, also, friend Trowbridge? I, I began in a muted voice, but stopped abruptly, for a puff of passing breeze must have closed the shutter, cutting off the moonbeam as a theatrical spotlight is shut off by a stage electrician. The illusion vanished instantly. 
There was no elfin dancing form before the painted likeness of old John Aglenberry, no sound of clinking anklets in the old house. We were just a pair of sleep-disheveled men in bathrobes and pajamas standing at a stairhead and staring foolishly into the darkness of a deserted hallway. I thought I saw I began again, but again I was interrupted, this time by the unmistakable clatter of the handbell in Aglenberry's room. We raced down the corridor to him and flung open the door. Mr. Aglenberry. De Grandin gasped, did it did anything come into your room? Dr. Trowbridge and I the young man sat up in bed, grinning sheepishly at us in the double beam of our flashlights. I must be getting a case of nerves, he confessed. Never had the jumps like this before. Just a moment ago I fancied I felt something touch my lips, like the tip of a bat's wing, it was soft as velvet and so light I could scarcely feel it, but it woke me up and I grabbed the bell and began ringing, like a fool. Funny, too, he glanced toward the window it couldn't have been a bat, for I took particular pains to nail mosquito netting over that window this morning. It's why, it's Dorn. Sure enough, the length of strong netting which our host had thoughtfully tacked across the windows of both our room, and his, as a precaution against early spring insects, was rent from top to bottom as though by a knife. H apostrophe M, he muttered, it might have been a bat, at that, to be sure, de Grandin agreed, nodding so vigorously that he resembled a Chinese Mandarin, it might, as you say, Misher, have been a bat. But I think you would sleep more safely if you closed the window. Crossing the room he drew the casement uh, and shot the forged iron bolt into place. Bonus OIR, my friend he bowed formally at the doorway a good night, and be sure you leave your window closed. Would you gentlemen like to look at the property down by the lake? Aglenberry asked. As we finished our breakfast of bacon and eggs, coffee, and fried potatoes the following morning. Assuredly, de Grandin replied, as he donned top coat and cap, slipping his ever ready automatic pistol into his pocket, a soldier's first caution should be to familiarize himself with the terrain over which he is to fight. We marched down a wide, curving drive bordered by pollarded willows, toward the smooth sheet of water flashing in the early morning sunlight. We have one of the finest stands of native hardwood to be found anywhere in this part of the country, Aglenberry began, waving his stick toward an imposing grove to our right. Just the timber alone is worth well of all the copper riveted nerve. He broke off angrily, hastening his pace and waving his cane belligerently. See there? Some fool camper has started a fire in those woods. Hi there, you. Hi there, what are you doing? Hurrying through the trees we came upon a little clearing where a decrepit, weather-blistered van was drawn up beside a small spring, to moth-eaten appearing horses tethered to a nearby tree, and several incredibly dirty children wrestling and fighting on the short grass. A man in greasy corduroys lay full length on the ground, a black slouch hat pulled over his eyes, while another lounged in the doorway of the van. Two women in faded shawls and headkerchiefs and an amazing amount of pinchbeck jewelry were busily engaged, one in hewing down underbrush to replenish the campfire, the other stirring some sort of savory mess in large, smoke-blackened kettle which swung over the blazing sticks. What the devil do you mean by building a fire here? Aglenberry demanded angrily as we came to a halt. Don't you know you're likely to start a blaze in these woods? Go down to the lake if you want to camp. There's no danger of burning things up there. The women looked at him in sullen silence, their fierce black eyes smoldering angrily under their straight black brows, but the man lying beside the fire was not minded to be hustled from his comfortable couch. To mooch a stone by Dalek, he informed Aglin very lazily, raising the hat from his face, but making no other move toward obeying the summons to quit. To mooch a stone and sand. I like a to a grass to lay on. I stay here. See? By George, we'll see about that, replied our irate host. You'll stay here, will you? Like hell you will. Stepping quickly to the fire, he shouldered the crouching woman out of his path and scattered the blazing sticks from under the kettle with the vigorous kick of his heavy boot, stamping the flame from the brands and kicking earth over the embers. Stay here, will you? He repeated. We'll see about that. Pull your freight, and pull it in a hurry, or I'll have the whole gang of you arrested for trespass. The reclining gypsy leaped to his feet as though propelled by a spring. You tell me pull it off right? You keep my fire out? Phew. Ha, I show you some edding. 
His dirty hand flew to the girdle about his greasy trousers, and a knife's evil flash showed in the sunlight. You and you make da fool of Nikolai Brandovich. I show you. Slowly, with a rolling tread which reminded me of a tiger preparing to leap, he advanced toward Aglenberry, his little, porcine eyes snapping vindictively, his bushy eyebrows bent into an almost straight line with the ferocity of his scowl. A, B, N, Monsieur Le Bohemian, Jules de Grandin remarked pleasantly, were I in your shoes, and very dirty shoes they are, too I would consider what I did before I did it. The gypsy turned the murderous scowl on him, and stopped short in his tracks, his narrow eyes contracting to mere slits with apprehension. The Frenchman had slit his pistol from his pocket and was pointing its uncompromising black muzzle straight at the center of the room in his checked shirt. The Easter, the fellow pleaded, sheathing his knife hurriedly, and forcing his swarthy features into the semblance of a smile, I make a joke. I not mean to hurt your friend. I poor man, trying to make honest living by selling horses. I not mean to scare your friend. We t-a-k-a doc ham puffa he's land right away. Pardu, my friend, I think you will, de Grandin agreed, nodding approvingly. You will take your so filthy wagon, your horses, your women, and your brats from off this property. You leave at once, immediately, right away. He waved his blue steel pistol with an authoritative gesture. Come, I have already waited too long. Try not my patience, I beseech you. Muttering imprecations in their unintelligible tongue and showering us with looks as malignant as articulate curses, the gypsies broke camp under our watchful supervision, and we followed them down the grass-grown drive toward the lakefront. We watched them off the land, then proceeded with our inspection of the estate. Red Gables was an extensive property, and we spent the better part of the day exploring its farther corners. By nightfall all three of us were glad to smoke a sociable pipe and turn in shortly after dinner. I was lying on my back, staring straight upward to the high ceiling of our chamber, and wondering if the vision of the night before had been some trick of our imaginations when de grand and sharp, strident whisper cut through the darkness and brought me suddenly wide awake. Trowbridge, he murmured, I hear a sound. Someone is attempting entrance. I lay breathless a moment, straining my ears for any corroboration of his statement, but only the soughing of the wind through the evergreens outside and the occasional rasp of a bow against the house rewarded my vigil. Rats! I scuffed. Who tried to break into a house with such a reputation as this one's? Why, Mr. Selfridge told us even the tramps avoided the place as if it were a plague spot. Nevertheless, he insisted, as he drew on his boots and pulled a top coat over his pajamas, I believe we have uninvited guests, and I shall endeavor to mend their manners, if such they be. There was nothing to do but follow him. Downstairs, tiptoe, our flashlights held ready and our pistols prepared for emergency, we stole through the great, dark hall, undid the chain fastener of the heavy front door, and walked softly around the angle of the house. At de Grandin's direction, we kept to the shadow of the tall, black-branched pine trees which grew near the house, watching the moonlit walls of the building for any evidence of a housebreaker. It is there the young Aglenberry sleeps, de Grandin observed in low voice, as he indicated a partly open casement on the second floor, its small panes shining like nicker in the rays of the full moon. I observe he has not obeyed our injunctions to close his sash in the night time. Morbidly you. That which we did see last night might have been harmless, my friend, but, again, it might have been not, my friend, look, look. Stealthily, silently, as a shadow, a stooped form stole around the corner of the wall, paused huddled in a spot of darkness, where the moonbeams failed to reach, then slowly straightened up, crept into the light, and began mounting the rough rubble stone side of the house for all the world, like some great, uncanny lizard from the pre-Adamite days. Clinging to the protuberances of the rocks with claw-like hands, feeling for toeholds in the interstices, where cement had weathered away, the thing slowly ascended, nearer, and yet nearer Aglenberry's unlatched window. D-I-E-U to D-I-E-U, de Grandin muttered, if it be a phantom, our friend Aglenberry is in misfortune, for twas he himself, who left his window unfastened. If it be not a ghost parbleu. It had better have said its pater nosters, for when he puts his head in that window, I fire. I saw the glint of moonlight on the blue steel of his pistol barrel as he trained it on the climbing thing. 
Inch by inch the creature man or devil crept up the wall, reached its talon hands across the stone sill, began drawing itself through the casement. I held my breath, expecting the roar of de Grandin's pistol each second, but a sudden gasp of astonishment beside me drew my attention from the creeping thing to my companion. Look, French Robbridge, Regardez, il vio a US plate. He bade me in a tremulous whisper, nodding speechlessly toward the window into which the marauder was disappearing like a great black serpent into its lair. I turned my gaze toward the window again and blinked my eyes in unbelief. An odd luminescence, as if the moon's rays had been focused by a lens, appeared behind the window opening. It was like a mirror of dull silver, or a light faintly reflected from a distance. Tiny bits of impalpable dust, like filings from a silversmith's rasp, seemed floating in the air, whirling, dancing lightly in the converging moon rays, circling about each other like dust motes seen in a sunshaft through a darkened room, driving together, taking form. Literally out of moonlight, a visible, discernible something was being made. Spots of shadow appeared against the phosphorescent gleam, alternate highlights, and shadows became apparent, limning the outlines of a human face, a slender, oval face with smoothly parted hair sleekly drawn across a high, broad forehead, a face of proud-mouthed, narrow-nosed bees such as the highest caste women of the Rajputs have. A moment it seemed suspended there, more like the penumbra of a shadow than an actual entity, then seemed to surge forward, to lose its sharpness of outline, and blend, mysteriously, with the darkness of the night prowler's form, as though a splash of mercury were suddenly thrown upon a slab of carbon. A moment the illusion of light on darkness held, then a scream of wire-edged terror, mingled with mortal pain, shuddered through the quiet night, as a lightning flash rips across a thundercloud. The climber loosed both hands from the window sill, clawed frantically at the empty air above him, then hurtled like a plummet to the earth, almost at our feet. Our flashlights shot their beams simultaneously on the fallen man's face as we reached his side, revealing the features of Nikolai Brandovich, the gypsy Aglenberry had ordered off the place that morning. But it was a different face from that the Romani had displayed when threatening Aglenberry or attempting to conciliate de Grandin. The eyes were starting from their sockets, the mouth hung open with an imbecile, hang-jawed flaccidity. And on the gypsy's lean, corded throat was an odd swelling, as though a powerful clamp had seized and crushed the flesh together, shutting off breath and blood, in a single mighty grasp. Both de Grandin and I recognized the thing, before us for what it was trust a physician to recognize it. Death is unique, and nothing in the world counterfeits it. The scoundrel had died before his body touched the ground. An O.M. on an O.M. De Grandin murmured wonderingly, and did you also see it, French Robbridge? I saw something, I answered, shuddering at the recollection. And what did you see? His words came quickly, like an eager lawyer cross-examining a reluctant witness. It had looked like a woman's face, I faltered, but an O.M. to D.I.E.U. Yes, he agreed, almost hysterically, a woman's face a face with nobody beneath it. Parbleu. My friend, I think this adventure is worthy of our steel. Come, let us see the young Aglenberry. We hurried into the house and up the stairs, hammering on our host's door, calling his name in frenzied shouts. Hey, what's up? His cheery voice responded, and next moment he unfastened the door and looked at us, a sleepy grin mantling his youthful face. What's the idea of you chaps breaking a fellow's door down at this time o' night? He wanted to know. Having bad dreams? Munmisher. De Grandin stammered, his customary aplomb deserting him. Do you mean have you been sleeping? Sleeping. The other echoed. What do you think I went to bed for? What's the matter? Have you caught the family ghost? He grinned at us again. And you have heard nothing, seen nothing you do not know an entrance to your room was almost forced? De Grandin asked incredulously. An entrance to my room? The other frowned in annoyance, looking quizzically from one of us to the other. Say, you gentlemen had better go back to bed. I don't know whether I'm lacking in a sense of humor, or what my trouble is, but I don't quite get the joke of waking a man up in the middle of the night to tell him that sort of cock and bull story. An O.M. munch Alfleur. De Grandin looked at me and shook his head wonderingly. He has slept through it all, French Robbridge. Aglenberry bristled with anger. What are you fellows trying to do, string me? He demanded hotly. Your hat, your coat, your boots, Misher. 
de Grandin exclaimed in reply. Come outside with us, come, and see the vile wretch, who would have slaughtered you like a pig in the shambles. Come and behold, and we shall tell you how he died. By mutual consent we decided to withhold certain details of the gypsy's death from the coroner's jury next day, and a verdict to the effect that the miscreant had come to his death while attempting to break and enter the dwelling house of one John Aglenberry, in the night time, forcibly, feloniously ought against the form of the statute in such case made and provided was duly returned. The gypsy was buried in the potter's field, and we returned to our vigil in the haunted house. Aglenberry was almost offensively incredulous concerning the manner of the gypsy's death. Nonsense! He exclaimed when we insisted we had seen a mysterious, faintly luminous face at the window before the would-be housebreaker hurtled to his death. You fellows are so fed up on ghost lore that you've let this place's reputation make you see things things which weren't there. Misher, de Grandin assured him with injured dignity, it is that you speak out of the conceit of boundless ignorance. When you have seen one half part of you, one quarter, or one eighth the things I have seen, you will learn not to sneer at whatever you fail to understand. As that so magnificent Misher Shakespeare did say, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Probably, our host interrupted, smothering a yawn, but I'm content to let him stay there. Meantime, I'm going to bed. Good night. And up the stairs he marched, leaving us to share the warmth of the crackling pitch pine fire. De Grandin shook his head pityingly after the retreating youngster. He is the perfect type of that Monsieur Babbitt, he confided. Worldly, materialistic, entirely devoid of imagination. Parbleu, we have them in France, too. Did they not make mock of Pasteur, Le Grand, when he announced his discoveries to a skeptical world? Most assuredly. Like the poor, the materialist we have always with us. Ah, what is that? Do you hear it, Trowbridge, my friend? Faintly, so faintly it was like the half-heard echo of Anico, the fine, musical jangle of tiny bells wafted to us through the still, cold air of the dark old house. In there, twas in the library it sounded. The Frenchman insisted in an excited whisper. As he leaped to his feet and strode across the hall. Your light, friend Trowbridge, quick, your light. I threw the beam of my electric torch about the high-walled, somber old reading room, but nothing more ghostly than the tall walnut bookcases, empty of books, and laden only with dust these many years, met our eyes. Still the soft, alluring chime sounded somewhere in the shadows, vague and indefinite, as the cobwebbed darkness about us, but insistent, as a trumpet call heard across uncounted miles of night. Morbidly, you, but this is strange. De Grandin asserted, circling the room with quick, nervous steps. Trowbridge, Trowbridge, my friend, as we live, those bells are calling us, calling us, call you, they are here. He had halted before a carved panel, under one of the old bookcases, and was on his hands and knees, examining each figure of the conventionalized flowers and fruits which adorned its surface. With quick, questing fingers he felt the carvings, like a cracksman feeling, out the combination of a safe. An O.M. month fromage, I have it. He called in lilting triumph as he bore suddenly down upon a bunch of carved grapes, and the panel swung suddenly inward upon invisible hinges. Trowbridge, Monami, regard as V.O.I.U.S. Peering into the shallow opening left by the heavy, carved plank, we beheld a package carefully wrapped in linen, dust-covered and yellowed with age. Kendall's, if you please, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin commanded, as he bore our find in triumph to the hall. We shall see what secret of the years these bells have led us to. He sank into his armchair and began unwinding the linen bands. Ah! Uh, and what is this? He unreeled the last of the bandages and displayed a small roll of red Morocco leather, a compact little case such as an elder generation of men carried with them for supplying needles, buttons, thread, and other aids to the womanless traveler. Inside the wallet was a length of tough, aged and parchment and attached to it by a loop of silk was a single tiny hawk bell of gold, scarcely larger than a bead, but capable of giving off a clear, penetrating tinkle, as the parchment shook into Grandin's impatient hands. I looked over his shoulder in fascinated interest, but drew back with disappointment as I saw the vellum was covered with closely written scrawls somewhat resembling shorthand. You apostrophe M. De Grandin regarded the writing a moment, then tapped his even, white teeth with a meditative forefinger,
This will require much study, French Robridge. He murmured. Many languages have I studied, and my brain is like a room, where many people speak together out of the Babel I can distinguish but few words, unless I bear my attention on some one talk. This he tapped the crinkling parchment as Hindustani, if I mistake not, but to translate it will require more time, and these candles will burn. Nevertheless, we shall try. He hurried to our bedroom, returning in a moment with a pad of paper and a fresh supply of candles. I shall work here for a time, he announced, reseating himself before the fire. It will be long before I am prepared for bed, and it may be well for you to seek repose. I shall make but poor company these next few hours. I accepted the dismissal with an answering grin, and, taking my candle, mounted the stairs to bed. A. B. N., my friend, you do sleep, like the dead the righteous dead who have no fear of purgatory. De Grandin's voice roused me the following morning. The bright spring sunshine was beating into our chamber through the open casement, and a puff of keen breeze fluttered the trailing bedclothes, but my friend's face rivaled the brilliance of the breaking day. Triumphy! He exclaimed, brandishing a sheaf of papers above his blonde head. It is finished. It is complete. It is done altogether entirely. Attend me, my friend. Listen with care, for you are not like to hear such a tale soon again, lord of my life and master of my heart, this day is the fulfillment of the fate overhanging the wretched woman, who has unworthily been honored by your regard, for this night I was bidden by my father, to choose, whether I would be married by the priest to the god Kandaka, and become a temple bay at Irand my lord well knows what the life of such an one is, or go to the shrine of Amkar, god of destruction, to become Kurban. I have chosen to make the leap, my lord, for there is no other way for Amari. We have sinned, thou against thy people and I against mine, in that we did dare defy Varna and love, when such love is forbidden between the races. Varna forbids it, the commands of thy people. And mine forbid it, and yet we loved. Now our brief dream of Galus is broken, as the mists of morning break, and fly before the scarlet lances of the sun, and thou returnest to thy people. Amari goes to her fate. By the leap I assure my sinful spirit of a resting place in Kalis, for to the Kurban all sins are forgiven, even unto that of taking the life of a Brahmin, or giving herself in love to one of another race, but she, who retreats from the leap commates a sin with each step so great that a thousand reincarnations cannot atone for it. In this life the walls of Varna stand between us, but, perchance, there may come a life, when Amari inhabits the body of a woman of the Sahib's race, or my lord and master may be clothed in the flesh of one of Amari's people. These things it is not given Amari to know, but this she knows full well, throughout the seven cycles of time which shall endure through all the worlds, and through all eternity, when worlds, and the gods themselves shall have shuddered into dust, Amari's heart is ever, and always inclined to the Sahib, and the walls of death, or the force of life shall not keep her from him. Farewell, master of Amari's breath, perchance we shall meet again upon some other star, and our waking spirits may remember the dream of this unhappy life. But ever, and always, Amari loves thee, Sahib John. Yes? I asked, as he finished reading. And then? Parbleu, my friend, there was no then. He answered. Listen, you do not know India? I do. In that so depraved country they do consider that the woman who goes to the bloody shrine of the god Amkar and hurls herself down from a cliff upon his bloody altar attains to sainthood? It was that which this poor one meant when she did speak of the leap in her farewell note to her white lover. Kurban is the word in their so detestable language for human sacrifice, and when she speaks of attaining chaos she refers to their heathenish word for heaven. When she says Varna stood between them she did mean caste. Kar you, you English, you Americans. Always you drive yourselves crazy with thoughts of what should and what should not be done, and O.M. on C.O.Q. Why did not this Mr. Aglenberry the Elder take this hinge woman to wife, if he loved her, and thumb his nose at her brown-skinned relatives, and has fair-eyed English kin as well? Tis what a Frenchman would have done in luck case. But no, he must needs allow the woman he loved to hurl herself over a cliff for the edification of a crowd of monkey-faced heathen, who are undoubtedly stewing in hell at this moment, while he ran overseas to America, and built him a mansion in the wilderness. A mansion, pardieu. A mansion without the light of love in its rooms, or the footfalls of little children on its floors. N-O-M-D-I-E-U-D-N-O-M-D-I-E-U.
a mansion of melancholy memories, it is. A B.A.S. such a people. They deserve la prohibition, nothing better. He walked back and forth across the room in a fury of disgust, snapping his fingers and scowling ferociously. All right, I agreed, laughing in spite of myself. We'll grant all you say, but where does that get us as regards Red Gables? If the ghost of this Hindu girl haunts this house, how are we going to lay it? How should I know? He returned peevishly. If the ancient fires of this dead woman's love burn on the cold hearth of this sacred house, who am I to put them out? Oh, it is too pitiful, too pitiful, that such a love as theirs should have been sacrificed on the altar of Varnicast. Hello, hello, up there. Came a cheery hail from the hall, below. You chaps up yet? Breakfast is ready, and we've got callers. Come down. Breakfast? De Grandin snorted disgustedly. He talks of breakfast in a house where the ghost of murdered love dwells. But he turned an impish grin on me. I hope he has compounded some of those so delicious flapjacks for us, even so. Dr. de Grandin, this is Dr. Wiltsey, Aglinberry introduced as we descended to the hall. Dr. Trowbridge, Dr. Wiltsey. Wiltsey is superintendent of a sanitarium for the feeble minded over there. He waved his arm in a vague gesture, and when he heard Dr. de Grandin was in the neighborhood, he came over for a consultation. It seems oh, you tell him your troubles, Wiltsey. Dr. Wiltsey was a pleasant looking young man with a slightly bald head and large lensed, horn rimmed spectacles. He smiled agreeably as he hastened to comply with Aglinberry's suggestion. Fact is, doctor, he began, as de Grandin piled his plate high with flap the jacks, we've got a damn peculiar case over at Thornwood. It's a young girl who's been in our charge for the past twelve years ever since she was ten years old. The poor child suffered a terrible fright when she was about six, according to the history we have of her case. Horses of the carriage in which she and her mother were riding ran away, threw them both out, killed the mother. And well, when they picked the youngster up, she was just one of God's little ones. No more reason than a two months old baby. Her family's rich enough, but she has no near relatives, so she's been in our care at Thornwood, as I said, for the past twelve years. She's always been good as gold, scarcely any trouble at all, sitting on the bed or the floor and playing with her fingers or toes like an infant most of the time. But lately she's been acting up like the devil. Fact. Tried to brain the nurse with a cup three nights ago and made a break at one of the matrons yesterday morning. From a simple, sweet-tempered little idiot she's turned into a regular hellcat. Now, if she'd been suffering from ordinary dementia, I'd... Very good, very good, my friend, de Grandin replied, as he handed his plate to Aglinberry for further replenishment. I shall be delighted to look at your patient this morning. Parbleu, a madhouse will be a pleasant contrast to this never-enough-to-be-execrated place. He likes my house, Aglinberry commented to Dr. Wiltsey, with a sardonic grin, as we rose, and prepared to go to the sanitarium. Thornwood Sanitarium was a beautiful, remodeled private country home, and differed in no wise from the nearby estates except that the park about the house was enclosed in a high stone wall topped with a Chevox day fries of barbed wire. How's Marianne, Miss Underwood? Wiltsey asked, as we entered the spacious central hall, and paused at the door of the executive office. Worse, doctor, replied the competent-looking young woman in nurse's uniform, at the desk. I've sent Mattingly up to her twice this morning, but the dosage has to be increased each time, and the medicine doesn't seem to hold as well. H apostrophe M, Wiltsey muttered noncommittally, then turned to us with an anxious look. Will you come to see the patient, gentlemen? Phew, to Aglinberry, if you wish. I imagine this'll be a new experience for you. Upstairs, we peered through the small aperture in the door barring the demented girl's room. If we had not been warned of her condition, I might easily have taken the young woman asleep on the neat, white cot for a person in perfect health. There was neither the emaciation nor the obesity commonly seen in cases of dementia, no drawing of the face, not even a flaccidity of the mouth as the girl lay asleep. Her abundant dark hair had been clipped short as a discouragement to the vermin which seem naturally to gravitate to the insane in spite of their keeper's greatest care, and she was clothed in a simple muslin nightdress, cut modestly at the neck and without sleeves. One cheek, pale from confinement, but otherwise flawless, 
lay pillowed on her bent arm, and it seemed to me the poor girl smiled in her sleep with the wistfulness of a tired and not entirely happy child. Long, curling lashes fringed the ivory lid which veiled her eyes, and the curving brows above them were as delicately penciled and sharply defined as though drawn on her white skin with a camel's hair brush. La pauvre enfant. De Grandin murmured compassionately, and at the sound of his voice the girl awoke. Gone instantly was the reposeful beauty from her face. Her lips stretched into a square like the mouth of one of those old Greek tragic masks, her large, brown eyes glared fiercely and from her gaping red mouth issued such a torrent of abuse as might have brought a blush to the face of the foulest fishwife in Billingsgate. Wiltsey's face showed a dull flush as he'd earned to us. I'm dashed if I can understand it, he admitted she goes on this way for hours on and now. Eh, is it so? De Grandin responded. And what, may I ask, have you been doing for this condition? It appears more like delirium and like dementia, my friend. Well, we've been administering small doses of brandy and strychnine, but they don't seem to have the desired effect, and the doses have to be increased constantly. Ah. Uh. De Grandin's smile was slightly satirical, and has it never occurred to you to employ hypnotics? Hyacin by example. By George, it didn't. Wiltsey confessed. Of course, hyacin would act as a cerebral sedative, but we'd never thought of using it. Very well. I suggest you employ a hypodermic injection of hyacin hypobromide de Grand and dismiss the case with an indifferent shrug of his shoulders, but Aglenberry, moved by that curiosity which is akin to fascination felt by the normal person regarding the insane, looked past him at the raving girl inside the cell. An instant change came over her. From a cursing, blaspheming maniac, the girl became a quiet, sorrowful-looking child, and on her suddenly calm face was such a look of longing as I have seen children undergoing strict diet give some particularly toothsome and forbidden dainty. Young Aglenberry suppressed a shudder with difficulty. Poor child, he muttered, poor, poor little girl, to be so lovely and so hopeless. Oh, you I, Misher, de Grandin agreed moodily, as we went down the stairs. You do well to pity her, for the intelligence the very soul of her has been dead these many years, only her body remains alive, and pity the D.I.E. you what a life it is. Ah, if only some means could be found to graft the healthy intelligence animating a sick body into that so healthy body of hers, what an economy. He lapsed into moody silence, which remained unbroken during our drive back to Red Gables. The sun had gone down in a blaze of red against the western sky, and the pale new moon was swimming easily through a tumbling surf of a bank of foaming cirrus clouds, when the deep-throated, belling bay of a hound came echoing to us from the grounds outside the old house. Grand D.I.E.U. De Grandin leaped nervously from his chair. What is that? Do they hunt in this country while the mating season is but blossoming into flower among the wild things? No, they don't, Aglenberry answered testily. Someone has let his dogs out on my land. Come on, let's chase him off. I won't have him poaching on the game here like that. We trailed out of the hall and walked quickly toward the sound of the baying, which rose fuller and fuller from the region of the lake. As we neared the dogs, the sound of human voices became audible. That you, Mr. Raglanberry. A man called, and the flash of an electric torch showed briefly among the new leaf thickets by the waterfront. Yes, our host answered shortly. Who the devil are you, and what are you doing here? We're from Thornwood, sir, the man answered, and we saw the gleam of his white hospital uniform under his dark top coat. The crazy girl, Marianne, got away about an hour ago, and we're trailing her with the hounds. She went completely off her head after you left this morning and fought so they couldn't give her the hypo without strapping her. After the injection she quieted down. But when the matron went to her room with dinner she suddenly woke up, threw the woman against the wall so hard she almost cracked her ribs and got clean away. She can't have gotten far, though, running over this broken country in her bare feet. Oh, hell. Aglenberry stormed, striking a bush beside the path a vicious slash with his stick. It's bad enough to have my place overrun with gypsies and gossiped about by all the country apps in the county, but when lunatics get to making a hangout of it, it's too much. Hope you find her, he flung back over his shoulder, as he'd earned toward the house. And for the Lord's sake, if you to get her, keep her at Thornwood. I don't want her chasing all over this place. Monsieur de Grandin began, 
But Taglinberry cut him short. Yes, I know what you'll say, he broke in. Do you want to tell me a ghost woman will protect me from the lunatics, just as she did from the gypsy, don't you? No, my friend, de Grandin began with surprising mildness. I do not think you need protection from the poor mad one. But he broke off with his sentence half-spoken, as he stared intently at an object hurrying toward us across a small clearing. Good God! Aglinberry exclaimed. It's she! The crazy girl! Seemingly gone mad himself, he rushed toward the white-robed figure in the clearing, brandishing his heavy stick. I'll handle her, he called back. I don't care how violent she is, I'll handle her. In another moment he was halfway across the cleared space, his thick walking stick poised for a blow which would render the maniac unconscious. Any medical student with the most elementary knowledge of insanity could have told him a lunatic is not to be cowed by violence. As though the oaken cudgel had been a wisp of straw, the maniac rushed toward him, then stopped a scant dozen feet away and held out her tapering arms. John, she called softly, a puzzling, exotic thickness in her pronunciation. John, Sahib, it is I. Aglinberry's face was like that of a man suddenly roused from sound slumber. Astonishment, incredulity, joy like that of a culprit reprieve as the hangman knots the noose about his neck shone on his features. The threatening club fell with a soft thud to the turf, and he gathered the madwoman's slender body to his breast, covering her upturned face with kisses. Amari, my Amari, Amari, my beloved. He crooned in a soft, sobbing voice. Oh, my love, my precious, precious love. I have found you, I have found you at last. The girl laughed lightly, and in her laughter there was no hint or taint of madness. Not to Mari, Marianne, in this life, John, she told him, but yours, John Sahib, whether we stand beside the Ganges or the Hudson, beloved through all the ages. Ah, got her, sir. The hospital attendants, a pair of bloodhounds tugging at the leash before them, broke through the thicket at the clearing's farther side. That's right, sir, hold her tight till we slip the straight jacket on her. Aglinberry thrust the girl behind him and faced the men. You can't have her, he announced uncompromisingly. She's mine. W-H-A what? The attendant stammered, then turned toward the underbrush and called to some invisible companion. Hey, Bill, come, er, there's two of them. You can't have her, Aglinberry repeated, as two more attendants reinforce the first pair. She's going to stay with me always. Now, look here, sir, the leader of the party argued, that girl's a dangerous lunatic, she nearly killed a matron this evening, and she's been regularly committed to Thornwood Sanitarium. We've tracked her here, and we're going to take her back. Over the dead corpse of Jules de Grandin, the Frenchman interrupted, as he pressed forward. Parbleu, me, I am in authority here. I shall be responsible for her conduct. The man hesitated a moment, then shrugged his shoulders. It's your funeral if anything happens on account of this, he warned. Tomorrow Dr. Wiltsey will start legal proceedings to get her back. You can't win. Ha, huh, can I not? The little Frenchman's teeth gleamed in the moonlight. My friend, you do not know Jules de Grandin. There is no lunacy commission in the world to which I cannot prove her sanity. I do pronounce her cured, and the opinion of Jules de Grandin of the Sorbonne is not to be lightly sneezed upon, I do assure you. To Aglinberry he said, pick her up, my friend, pick her up and bear her to the house, lest the stones bruise her tender feet. Dr. Trowbridge and I will follow, and protect you. Parbleu he glared defiantly about him me, I say nothing shall separate you again. Leon. For heaven's sake, de Grandin, I besought, as we followed Aglinberry, and the girl, toward the house, what does this all mean? Morbleu, he nodded solemnly at me, it means we have won ten thousand dollars, friend Trowbridge. No more will the ghost of that so pitiful hinge woman haunt this house. We haven't our fee. Yes, but I pointed mutely toward our host, as he strode through the moonlight with the girl in his arms. Ah, that. He laughed a silent, contented laugh. That, my friend, is a demonstration that the ancient fires of love die not, no matter how much we heap them with the ashes of hate and death. The soul of Amari, the sacrificed Hindu girl, has come to rest in the body of the lunatic, Marianne, just as the soul of John Aglinberry the Elder was reborn into the body of his namesake and double, John Aglinberry the Younger. Did not the deceased Indian girl promise 
that she would someday come back to her forbidden lover in another shape. Parbleu, but she has fulfilled her vow. Always have the other members of Aglenberry's family been unable to live in this house because they were of a clan who had helped separate the elder lovers. Now, this young man, knowing nothing of his uncle's intimate affairs but bearing in his veins the blood of the older Aglenberry, and on his face the likeness of the uncle, too, must have borne within his breast the soul of the disappointed man, who ate out his heart in sorrow and loneliness in this house which he had builded in the American woods. And the spirit of Amari, the Hindu, who has kept safe the house from alien blood, and from the members of her soulmate's family, who would have robbed him of his inheritance, did find me rat hand the healthy body of a lunatic, whose soul, or intelligence, if you please, had long since sped, and entered there and to dwell on earth again. Did you not see sanity and longing looking out of her eyes, when she beheld him in the madhouse this morning, my friend? Sanity. But yes, it was recognition, I tell you. Her violence? Twas but the clean spirit of the woman fighting for mastery of a body long untenanted by an intelligence. Were you to attempt to play a long disused musical instrument, Trowbridge, my friend, you could make but poor work of it first, but eventually you would be able to produce harmony. So it is in this case. The spirit sought to use a long disused brain, and at first, the music she could make was nothing but noise. Now, however, she has seen the mastery of her instrument, and henceforth the body of Marianne will function as that of a healthy young woman. I, Jules de Grandin, will demonstrate her sanity to the world, and you, my friend, shall help me. Together we shall win, together we shall make certain that these lovers thwarted in one life shall complete the cycle in happiness. ABN, he twisted the end of his blonde mustache and set his hand at a rake a shangle on the side of head, it is possible that somewhere in space there waits for me the spirit of a woman whom I have loved and left in another life. I wonder, when she comes, if I, like the lucky young Aglenberry yonder, shall wake, and remember, and understand? The End This audio was brought to you by Yakitome. Voice of the Web. Yakitome.com